it's intellectually lazy. If we always tweet and put on social media the horrifying news without it in each and every tweet to provide a solution. Because we should be then, you know, um, there is also a correlation. I love that. That awesome. build your, please build your thesis so that uh, you could consider both climate mitigation uh, but also climate adaptation because 50% of what we should be doing and hopefully this is not bull <laughs> bullshit but that's a, the 50% we should be doing is actually also to get prepared because the climate is changing. I mean one could, should think you know as a layman that mm. food and uh, you know is something that should is coming from nature mm. and then we learn out that the system that we created is actually emitting one for the, all the emissions. So, I mean, bullshit. <laughs> I think that's crazy. I think you're spot on on something here. Welcome to The Switch, not just another podcast, but the podcast where we educate you, entertain you to make sure that you are able to do The Switch for a better and greener planet. My name is Kristina hockstrom and I am the host of the show, also a naive optimist with rebellic streak, but always supported by the amazing team behind the camera. Emil, uh, Jacob, DMB, Baseload are there to support you and make sure that we have this podcast. If you like it, make sure to subscribe, share, and be a part of the communication. Today, I have someone with me who I want to uh, elevate highly. Let me introduce today's guest. Pia Erkinheimo works for the Finnish Climate Fund as a member of uh, leadership team responsible for deal flower customer relationships. Her background, though, is from companies like Nordea, Nokia, Capgemini. The European Commission has benefited from her SNT and I experience for 15 plus years as an innovation expert and a jury member. And she has advised that G7 country is in digital technologies. What about that? Advanced robotics and data economy. Besides that, she is a member of the board of Lappan Hena Ranta University. Did I say that right? I'm not sure. We'll find out soon enough of technology in Finland and is or has been involved in half a dozen growth companies, either as an investor, board member or member of the executive team. She is a member of FIBAN, Finnish Business Angels Network, where she's also a member of the board in 2018 and regularly writes a column to Technica and Talus. Uh, Technology and Economy, would that be translated? A uh, weekly professional magazine. Pia is also a co-founder of Women in Tech in Finland, network of companies standing for diversity and inclusion. She is passionate about climate tech and digital climate tech and the coexistence of humans and machines that make us more human, plus love playing the violin. Pia describes herself as Jacqueline, of all trades in innovation. Let's find out more about this woman. Pia, welcome to The Switch. Well, thank you. This is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's super exciting for me too, especially when I listen and read this. Listen, we read that your motto uh, is, a, uh, is a sentence from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Did I say that right? Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, oui. Yeah. And she says, as for the future, your task is not to foresee, but to enable it. That's a very beautiful sentence. Mm. Why do you like that so much? Well, first of all, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry uh, is the philosopher, French philosopher, who wrote uh, Le Petit Prince, uh, The Little Prince book mm. that we all love. That we love uh, yeah. So that's why. And then I really see that, you know, since nobody has the crystal ball, so 
let's just make one. So it's really enabling the future to come. And then there is a very wise man, Gold Gibson, who said that the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So these are kind of the slogans, slogans that, you know, have guided my, my stuff uh, to this point. Well, uh, I'm eager to find out a little bit more about you. And that's why we're going to roll the wheel of questions. Let's see what Pia gets to answer so we get to know her more. Wheel of Questions What is your proudest accomplishment? I'm a mother, so I have uh, Ines and Henry, my twins. I think we go back to basics. That's, that's, that's what I'm very happy for. Actually, uh, it says a lot about you and the human side of you, mentioning all of that with all of your accomplishes, accomplishments that you have actually made. How old are they? They are teens already, so uh -huh. I learn a lot from them. So I, I will, depending on what you ask, so I most likely will quote them more than <laughs> think myself. I've learned so much nowadays. Then you will love our segment about the future, uh, comment from the future, or the question from the future, where we have kids asking uh, questions. Okay, to let's see. Yeah, you'll like that. Let's uh, see what you get as a second question. Wheel of questions. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Ah, I want to be an aviator. I wanted mm -hmm. to, and I partially did that. I had a glider's license during my student times. Now I don't have time to be on the airports, you know, looking the clouds and seeing if there's a termite coming or is that the cumulus cloud, etc. So uh, mm. I think that was my kind of a thinking those days. But mm, I think this is, this is I'm, I'm happy with that. That was my, my childhood plan. <laughs> but you might go back to it then when, you, when your teenagers are out of the house and you have more time. Yes. Well, I did go back actually to playing violin. Uh, I you? think that that was kind of a... I think aviation currently is, um, from the technology perspective especially... Um, quite old fashioned. Mm -hmm. It's good that it is though, because the, secu the, the security and trust is there, not even 99.9% important, 99.99999% important, mm -hmm. but basically, and, uh, and of course we are getting now all the electric solutions uh, and uh, kind of um, unmanned, uh, unmanned EVTOLs, which they're called unmanned uh, vertical uptake and landing uh, thing, um, uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, things. We have our, well, there's so many different use cases for, dr uh, for drones. Um, and and so forth. So there is, of course, room for innovation in there. But but, I, mean, like, but I think mm -hmm. it says a lot, a lot about you. You're actually uh, like making a decision here that aviation is not tech savvy enough, and that also makes you choose something else. Then it's yeah. interesting. It says yeah. a lot about you with integrity and morale. Great. <laughs> Why do you think that innovation is so important in tackling the climate crisis? Well, I mean, innovation is a buzzword uh, as such. Um, yeah, the most important thing is to, uh, to ask why, 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 uh, like the um, uh, service de designers encourages us to ask. Then the, the answer for what comes easier, but then mm. it's all about how. So innovation is really about how. Mm. And in uh, climate tech, it's really important uh, to understand that some ideas that were already came up to 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 uh, humankind already in the 1960s, etc., may now have a use case, business case, and intermediary technologies that in, they they enable them to happen now. So. Basically, we should look at innovation is a very large way uh, when we talk about climate tech and not to limit that. And that's why it's very important. But it really the timing is very interesting uh, now when we try to fix the planet for the next generations to come. So if we say that innovation is important for the climate crisis and it's, you said just that it's connected to the climate change we need to do, 
what what needs to be done? What are the hurdles? Why are we not moving faster in innovation? It's a systematic, challenging, wicked problem that we humans have created. Mm. Let me take an example. I'm born and raised in Helsinki, so I, uh, I take Finland as an example. Early 70s, one planet was enough for uh, population that live on mm -hmm. the on the geographic area called Finland. And then I was asking that, you know, uh, what was the standard of living? How miserable it was in early 70s? I'm, I don't know. So uh, what was the quality of life? Mm. And um, people who remember that, of course, they, you know, sugarcoat their memories. They said, well, it wasn't that bad in 70s. Maybe the political atmosphere was this and that, um, you know, but, you know, like that it was quite a good life. We didn't have internet and all the uh, entertainments. And I mean, the quality of life was good in Scandinavia or mm. often Scandia uh, or in the Nordics then already. And uh, so it's a man-made challenge that we are now solving, which is actually being caused during the lifetime I'm, uh, I've been kind of uh, alive. Mm. So uh, we should be fixing it. And that's why the, the crisis, I see that that we can make it. We can make the planetary uh, boundaries not kind of a squeezing us, but in uh, making uh, of our lively, uh, our way of living uh, more beautiful, more meaningful, more human. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I'm answering to your question anymore, but can you catch up with my philosophy that, that I am a true believer in technology, but it's not enough. Uh, at all, because we need philosophers, we need designers, we need artists, we need social scientists, we need uh, everybody to make sense out of this. You actually uh, said, now I'm quoting you, that uh, coexi coexistence of humans and machine must make us more human. Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Is the, that the balance we're discussing? I think that's what I'm trying to get at, uh, mm. uh, come to, uh, is that uh, technology is seen often as a threat, and it changes our behaviors. Mm. But if we think how much, uh, at least in the Western world, uh, we behaved our living based on the revolution of communication technologies, mm. and it's been happening in our... I mean, I'm so old that when I was seven, I didn't get a mobile phone. Mm. I mean, like, uh, so we can do it still on my lifetime to get the fix it. You know, we can change our behavior and our coexistence with machines, with the technologies that uh, climate crisis uh, will now put to the limelight and, and just, you know, fix this thing what we we've have put, you know, that we humans have break. So, so we need the coexistence, but it bring, takes us back, to me at least, back to be more human. Because you also, I've, I've read that you said that digitalization is a double-edged sword when it comes to climate change. Uh, why is that and are there solutions to this problem? Well, with that is that I'm always saying that there is no, digi there is no climate solution without digitalization. Mm -hmm. However, uh, digitalization is uh, uh, emitter itself. So if we uh, think mm -hmm. uh, the situation in Western world, that we will double the uh, CO2 emissions by the year 25, 2025 from the level 2017. Mm. And if you count it from rare earth metals for all our gadgets, for hardwares, uh, to the data trash, excuse me, my language, mm. but we store so much data that that shouldn't be stored because it doesn't actually produce anything. We had this idea of... of uh, of, and still, there is a lot of relevant data that um, that learning algorithms can combine, mm. and then the, all the electricity for our cloud services. And uh, Nordic countries has benefited from our climate. Large uh, global companies have taken here their data centers. So in that way, digitalization is part of the solution, but also uh, digitalization should fix itself because it's an it's an emitter. And uh, the amount with, with that it takes uh, natural resources uh, is equivalent to our uh, our flying mm. annually. 
what you're saying here is that the digitalization is emitting itself and trying to solve the problem, but how do we solve this problem then? Well, um, those who are uh, those who are um, involved in from the gadget making from the uh, up to up to the software making uh, the industry as well is very. Uh, concerns about green questions. Mm. So uh, there are transitors coming now which only only use one tenth of the energy. Uh, they are um, they are talking about green coding, mm. which means that you just uh, I'm not the coder. <laughs> I programmed uh, just little. It was uh, called uh, Commander uh, 64. Mm. So now you can guess my age approximately. I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, so meaning meaning that you create green go uh, green code, which is then uh, much more, uh, um, or the aim is to be uh, less energy consuming. Um, we are replacing um, uh, electronics, uh, rare earth metals, uh, looking for to use them less, or then trying to replace them with uh, biomaterials. Mm. Again, Sweden and Finland are. Um, mm. You know, suddenly, you know, that that uh, first industry is actually uh, really, really, really hot at the moment and for seasonable time because there are great benefits uh, compared to mm. uh, rare earth metals or fossil materials, you know, that are based on oil, etc. Mm. So mm. The, they are fixing themselves. You're here representing an uh, investment company. Uh, and uh, we're talking now about tech and climate, but uh, what kind of investments related to climate change do you think are most important for us? I think it's pure maths. Yeah, since we have a knowledge uh, which areas of human activities are causing most of the CO2 emissions. Mm. So then we just look at, you know, uh, where can we have, find the lowest hanging fruits and where should we where should we focus and proceed mm. uh, our efforts immediately? Because we are in a hurry. The planet is warming up. Mm. So the sooner we make um, the fixes in those which are causing most of the emissions, the better. So that's how we prioritize uh, where we go in a, in a large scale. And uh, this is basically uh, bringing me uh, to my personal finding that the dirtier, the better. <laughs> I like that. Elaborate. Yes, because uh, I'm talking now about waste. I'm talking about, okay, energy. I'm talking about, about uh, uh, well, electricity, heating or cooling. Uh, okay, we shouldn't even talk about waste because waste uh, doesn't exist because waste is just a uh, side stream or raw material mm. to something else, uh, idealistically. <laughs> and this means that when we can... Uh, aim our great um, climate tech solutions to solve there where we cause most emissions. So that makes kind of, that's why I'm saying that in a hurry, the dirtier, the better. Uh, so then you'll find it from mining industries. And what shocked me as my background has been more to digital, I'm now in physical world mm -hmm. uh, quite a lot, uh, is that I didn't realize that, for example, our agriculture, our food industry, I mean, one could, should think, you know, as a layman, that mm. food and, uh, you know, is something that should, is coming from nature. Mm. And then we learn out that the system that we created is actually emitting one fourth of all the emissions. So, I mean... Bullshit. <laughs> I think that's crazy. I think you're spot on on something here. It's something that we think, and I think that this is a problem with the climate solution mm -hmm. and, and the switch we need to do, because sometimes we think that things are green, but they're not. Mm. And I think that you're proving this here now. Yeah, but nevertheless, so uh, so these things, like, that's why the dirtier, the better. And uh, and now we are back to agriculture and seeing. and, and But it's interesting that people who are working in that industry or primary production or so um, they are very uh, it's in their DNA that they do know, you know, how to do this, how to how to feed 8.5 billion people in a more uh, more, um, you know, regenerative agriculture way. Yeah. Mm, it's just that we need to fix the system. They can do it. They have the brains. They have the technologies. They know what to do. So, 
I agree. Fixing the system is a very important thing. I, we can go back to that one, but yeah. I'm actually a little bit curious. Like, what what is the investment strategy that you have at the Finnish uh, Climate Tech Fund? Our thinking is, since we are backed by Nestes Dividends, a uh, socialistic company, and we are actually under the umbrella of Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Employment in Finland. Mm. So we are part of the uh, Finland's uh, innovation financing ecosystem. So Which that, is amazing that it actually comes from there. Yes, it's it's uh, and our team is you know great and uh, we are we are we're working actively mm. to, to, towards this mission and we are being measured by impact. We are not maximizing our own revenue which also like is uh, of course we need to be profitable etc but you know that's not the aim. So our mm. investment strategy is for scaling Uh, climate tech and digital climate tech. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we have seen that there is a bottleneck in uh, not in the startup funding. I know especially Nordic countries, uh, Sweden and Finland and are great and Den Denmark and, and well, Norway had their oil. But, you know, they are a good hub for, for getting the seed funding. Or when it, we always talk, often talk about deep tech. So it's also about like pilot programs, which are still inside the, 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 the mother university. Mm. But then when you need to scale the demo, factory or demo facility and start delivering. So there is shortage of capital, especially for um, CapEx intensive. Mm -hmm. So which needs, uh, CapEx means that for machinery and for equipment type of companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we are complementing and sharing risk with so that private investors would even more courageously Uh, mm. look at climate tech, digital climate tech, and make the investments when we are there with our um, our fair market-driven, but still kind of a friendly uh, terms to mitigate the risk. It's a interesting because I think that you are spot on here because in the report that we read from the coalition that we have been mentioning uh, and talking about where the Nordic countries yeah. are going to create a powerhouse, it actually said that one of the problems was that uh, companies don't get investment long enough or late enough in their processes. And that's where the bottleneck is. So is that's actually what you are actually solving. Yeah, well, the, 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 it, uh, this is kind of because, um, you know, when we built our investment thesis, uh, um, of course, we were challenged when mm. we were doing our kind of a strategic proposal to uh, Marine's government mm. as, of a, as of a team. And then we used open uh, strategy methodology mm. and discussed with uh, people wiser than us or, or, you know, like also buying, getting the buy-in, but also really uh, like uh, not sparing our, you know, fooling ourselves with, you know, if there is no, why to fix if it ain't broken? Mm. And this was uh, the kind of the sweet spot uh, that was also pointed to us. But then we did some maths and looked some stats and, and uh, now we are really wanting to do this uh, well. And that's why our sweet spot Uh, as a minority financier, is from 4 million euros to 40 million euros. I hope you wrote that down now and let <laughs> everybody start calling you here. Oh, well, and, and my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. If you would give an advice for an investor or a startup in their situation, what, what would you give? Let's start with investors first. What's your advice to them? Please build your uh, investment strategy and your investment thesis. So, uh, of course, you choose climate tech mm -hmm. widely. Um, or if you have a team with special special uh, uh, qualifications, for example, for DAC, so, uh or, or like that, so uh, uh, carbon capture and uh, or, uh, facilities or energy like that. Mm. But then... That build your please build your thesis so that uh, you could consider both climate mitigation, uh, but also climate adaptation. Because 50 percent of what we should be doing, and hopefully this is not bull <laughs> bullshit, but that's a, the 50 percent we should be doing is actually also to get prepared 
because the climate is changing. Yeah. Because we don't, we are not in the point anymore that we could uh, keep it on the 1990 level, let alone 1970 level. So be constructive with your hypothesis that it's still wide enough, wide enough. Uh, even it may be a hard sell, you know, because often the LPs funding investors are, you know, want to know in particular. Mm. But climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And for startups, if you are in innovating in an area where you do a facility or you do physical, um, in physical, you know, things like, like, mm. uh, propels for hydrogen factories or all like these kind of things, uh, do remember to, uh, hire expertise or buy expertise, uh, from such, uh, financial experts that are used to maneuver with this kind of a capex intensive uh, plans. Mm. We've noticed that uh, great teams are scaling, but they are not necessarily, uh, usually they are very deep tech companies, but they are not, you know, like they are not used to how to roll the financing for an investment that goes over, over, you know, over 24 months even. Mm. So uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, a small piece of advice that when you're scaling, um, uh, and also, you know, it's for that type of, well, CEOs or uh, financial people also kind of, because they are sometimes in larger companies. So if they're passionate about jumping to be in an innovative company that scales. So this kind of, um, CFO type of a competency, it's different than in software as a service companies. Mm. So that would be very pragmatic one. And then uh, do a project with this emission reduction potential calculation. This is a competency that, that we all need because we need the balance sheet, which is telling you know, the company balance sheet and, and profit and loss report, uh, annual report, and then the planetary balance sheet. You know, what is the emission reduction potential your innovation is providing its externalities? You know and then, of course, you know, there can be something that that you need to also, you know, there is also the carbon uh, footprint. Yeah. So know your numbers. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Good. Thank you. I want to dive in a little bit more into Finnish Climate Fund. It was created to combat climate change boots low carbon industry and you you also said promoting dig digitalizations are you satisfied with the progress since the start yes i'm satisfied because it's our great team who is working hard together mm. with our our customers our mm. deal flow so uh it's um and i'm very optimistic um uh, since we started so little time ago uh, we've been looking in finland and then in lodging like uh, nordics and it's funny to say to my uh, at home, to my family and my teenagers, uh, which are having uh, uh, serious thoughts, you know, can we fix this and even depression that um, that mommy is working actually with the with those people every day that are working for making us, you know, solve the climate crisis. So um, in that sense, um I'm I'm seeing good things moving, and uh, we just recruited a great team. So we need to now deliver. We shouldn't have anything to, to complain as of a fund. Mm. Now it's execution, and we have a strong deal flow. And uh, and uh, now when I we have had uh, we started in the midst of mm. pandemic, so now we can also meet people from other Nordic countries, and now you know they learn to know us, and you know what's our hypothesis. So then then we can all collaborate and work together. So, so, but it, for us, it's now execution. Execution. I uh, look forward following up on that Thank one you. as well. Thank <laughs> you. I'm to... putting pressure on, yeah. <laughs> on me, my personally, on me and, and our teams. I want to follow up. Yesterday, uh, we were having a discussion in a, in, a pan, uh, in a panel debate where we were talking and, and you actually got the question about the future and so on. You have teenagers. You mentioned now that your teenagers have questions and are stressed. Do you feel that we are helping the younger generations enough? Do you have hope that we can provide this to them? I'm uh, challenging you as well, if I may, because please uh, do. Because um, I'm asking for a gospel of hope from media. Uh, there is a recent, very recent study. Uh, I mean, from this fall, uh, with 28 countries. 
uh, they were no, that they wasn't Sweden, but it was Norway, uh, Finland. Uh, I have a list there. Um, Netherlands, uh, Germany, also outside uh, Europe as well. Uh, maybe it was that research coalition or you know mm -hmm. scientists that knew each other. And there is the uh, teenagers, uh, or it was like uh, university students, so 18 to 25 years old, old have um, uh, climate anxiety. Mm. And it's causing them stress. And if we put then, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, the horrible war in Europe, um, you know, post-pandemic times, you couldn't access your school when you're a teenager, um, and then then this climate crisis. So uh, there is uh, there is uh, indeed uh, a direct link for depression and uh, and low moods among our our great great youth because um, the the I mean you can create a dystopic view of world uh, based on all the science that are proving is proving you know mm. what's happening and uh, as my colleague said uh, it's intellectually lazy if we always tweet and put on social media the horrifying news without it in each and every tweet to provide a solution because we should be then, you know, um, there is also a correlation. I love that. Yeah, honestly, I have awesome. promised to myself a PS small action. I don't tweet anymore about uh, climate related things unless there is the silver lining that this is a tweet regarding it's going shit. But hey, we had this solution that can mitigate that. So it's my small, I mean, like I don't have so many followers at all, but it's kind of that, that, uh, and we, uh, I call it gospel of hope. Mm. And uh, we shouldn't call it gospel, gospel, gospel of hope. We should be nudging the messages so that the tonality should change that, that actually here are the solutions. These are the great possibilities. Mm. And, and currently the landscape, especially in Finland, we scored highest with the depression, it was also correlated with social sciences, though I also said that it also have a link on, on actions. Hmm. I mean, you're just phrasing why we actually have this podcast, well, because we yeah. really think that we've been talking too much about what's not functioning and we need to elevate uh, individuals, organizations and, and other things that actually make something to do the switch. So yeah. thank you for, for making that point. And I would say that I think that my colleagues in media really do have a responsibility. And I love that not to be lazy intellectually, just to show something, but also to provide something of a, a solution. High okay. five on that one. <laughs> love it. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Pia, yeah, it's time for the question from the future that I promised you in the beginning of this show. Are you ready? Uh, I'm never ready, but I, I try. Here we go. Questions from our future. How can we make everybody work together? Well, we are all first and foremost humans. So, and we are social animals and we just just need to find the smallest common nominator that put us uh, to the same page. Hmm. And then we start writing uh, the story together with the page. I'm on that page. I think this sounds very idealistic, but this is a lot of hard work, uh, footwork, um, uh, virtual footwork, but only by talking and communicating. I mean, like, I don't know any other other way to do that. But I think that you're uh, onto something here, the common denominator, the smallest thing, because there's always something that we can connect around. And I think that it's important to try to dig that out, but that's not easy. That is actually uh, an uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> uncomfortable conversations. What do you think, Pia? What are the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have out there in order to move forward and make uh, the switch possible? Question that everybody is asking that, do we need to drop something of our lifestyle? Mm -hmm. uh, am I losing something when uh, in the journey towards uh, uh, resource-wise livelihoods? 
um, often it's that you have to, you know, have to drop something from your li- lifestyle. And that's not actually the case. You will get something perhaps much more valuable back. But this is at least one of the uh, uncomfortable questions that, hey, what do you do? Are you going to, for example, uh, I skipped uh, eating meat, but I can still uh, drive my old fashioned uh, gasoline car. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like stop thinking like bargaining. But this is the uncomfortable question. How should I, as a citizen, consumer, business, business decision maker, change my behavior and uh, how uncomfortable it is? And, you know, what is asked from me? What kind of uh, changes have you made that in your way of living and working when it comes to this? It's a lot about, um, you know, how do you commute? Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. So that's in the progress of, uh, of uh, in, our, in my family. Mm. Um, because I just found, you know, the car that I would like to our and own. We need to get rid of the second one. You know, we have two still. And, and then, then, so that's one thing. But what we've done uh, with my daughter is that uh, mm, it's something that uh, has to do with uh, almost 15% of the, emi- uh, of the emissions, CO2 emissions here. And it has to do with fashion and clothing. Mm. So we fix repair. We, we repair, uh, we, do, uh, we do a lot of around that domain. Um, it's my daughter who is educating me first, but then I realized that I did it also kind of naturally. So uh, we have a great closet from my unfortunately late grandma, mm. tailor-made uh, clothing that we can still tailor a bit more. And uh, so this is very big change. And then it's seen in our, our table. I mm. mean, how do we eat? So mm. that's, you know, that's... that's. Um, and and I, when I listen to you, I mean, it's not that you're giving something up. And I think that that's exactly the uncomfortable situation, conversation, the uncomfortable conversation yeah. that we need to have. Because it is not about giving up. It's just about changing a mindset. And that can be difficult, of course, behaviors from a person and so on. But I do think that what you're giving here is actually suggestions that it doesn't have to be so hard to change. It can be interesting and fun. I mean... Really- yeah, yeah, it has been certainly fun. It's funny when my, my daughter's a friend, um, a girlfriend said that, oh, when you can, I always know when you come to school and you've been on your mother's closet, I love your mother's style. <laughs> so I, I took it as a huge combina- yeah. compliment and, you know, I, I like for... From I mean, she was like, oh my, you know, embarrassment moment again. Yeah. So these kind of uh, these kind of things. One finding uh, that these teenagers taught me was that there is a movement that is European at least, uh, and it's called Extinction Rebellion, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's uh, young people going to the streets totally unviolently, but blocking traffic. Uh, in order to get the attention to climate crisis, because they also announced uh, climate crisis emergency all over Europe, and what um, and that, that's what they did also in Helsinki and some other uh, other uh, towns and places in uh, in in Finland. And of course, in Helsinki, they went in front of the parliament's house, Riksat, who said, "Oh, oh, disturb the 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 traffics," yeah. and they've done it a couple of times. But what my uh, reference group in is the teenage, my teenagers and their friends said and came to me one day and say, hey, I talk with my friend Hulda and we thought that this Extinction Rebellion thing is actually quite stupid because uh, what they only do is they get people irritated because they block their traffic. Mm-hmm. And that's what the... Uh, and police is moving them, and then uh, then um, others are playing as charity, their fines, etc. Uh, but the twi- the teenagers really said that you know that that you know I think it's dull. I mean, why to communicate this via via uh, creating uh, creating uneasy situation, mm. uh, and it takes uh, attention basically away from the mission. Of fixing the climate, so I think this is this is something that that you know at least woke me up 
with my mission, you know, small my personal mission of mm. Gospel of Hope. It's our responsibility, everyone's responsibility, to bring the solutions forward. Yes, and in front of the debate. I think it's an excellent example. I'm gonna. And it's the awesome button awesome. because I think it's so important what you're actually saying here. And it is an uncomfortable conversation. We think that we can do it as we have done it before. But I think that even now we are at a stage where we need to think differently. How can we get people's attention about uh, the situation we are in? How can we elevate good examples that we can all follow and be inspired yeah. by? I think that uh, you are an excellent example of a person like that. <laughs> I don't uh, know. Thank you for that. Pia, what are your takeaways from today's conversation? First of all, I, I praise for the methodology, how you conducted me as I'm not a professional um, media person. So I like that a lot. Thank you. And it was uh, easy for you. As I, <laughs> well, I am then. Uh, but my my key takeaway is that actually you are doing you are doing the gospel of hope thing. So um, I'm very happy that you carry this work on and you have this this um, media platform that you generated. So uh, my takeaway is, at least when I go home to Helsinki, is that, hey, we should start uh, following your media. I mean, and this is not a paid comment. This is not a paid <laughs> comment but at all. And, and then, um, of course, your, your clever, uh, clever concerns um, regarding the, the kind of the change that mm. we need to do. Thank you. Pia, for coming here, for telling us about the initiative of, of the Finnish Fund and also being so inspir uh, inspirational for me as well to listen to. I love how you're bringing stories to life. If you want to be a part of the Gospel of Hope, which I love, thank you, Pia, <laughs> I will use that. Uh, we want you to be that too. Please make sure to share this episode to someone that you care about, that you want to be a part of this transformation that we're going through. Subscribe to all our communication channels so you don't miss a beat. And please engage in the communication. Write us, tell us about someone you want us to have on the show maybe. And of course, my ending note is always, take care of yourself and please, if you can, someone else as well. I wish you the best of day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Pia. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,